Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you please be seated. Technology is great when it works, isn't it? <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. That's a, a, a good reason for you to bring your Bibles with you when, you when you come to church and pick up maybe pick up a, a hymnal when you come on in, too, even though probably 98 out of 100 times you the hymnal back, you never, you never need it. I came across a, a story uh, as I was preparing for today that I thought had, had a bit of relevance. It, uh, it's a true story. It comes from a number of years ago, five, maybe ten years ago. A fellow by the name of Tom Lind uh, is a salesman from Montana. Uh, I'm not sure what he was selling, but his, uh, his area of uh, uh, sales and everything was probably maybe a good bit of the western part of the United States at any rate. He was... This took place uh, one November, not uh, not too long before Thanksgiving. He was driving his pickup truck uh, with a big camper on the back uh, back end and heading south in Oregon along the coast. Uh, when he decided, uh, uh, just on a spur of the moment type of thing, one of these uh, these decisions that you know we do, and decided to take a scenic road, uh, route to his next destination. So he took uh, took this turn off. And uh, quickly uh, was heading up into the into the mountains into the high elevations. It turns out he had turned on to a to a road that was actually part of a, a part of a state park, and uh, it was drizzling, raining. Uh, and as he got up into higher elevations, that rain turned into snow, and quickly turned into one of these freak blizzards uh, that uh, was that would develop occasionally. We don't know much about that living in Florida, but if you lived up north, maybe you've been in that. Uh, uh, I grew up in New Jersey. We didn't have very many blizzards, but at any rate, it was soon he was in the middle of what, what they call a whiteout, and he, couldn't, he just could not go. He had to stop. And so, uh, uh, so when the, the snow uh, finally stopped, uh, he was, his truck was covered. He says, wow, what do I do? Um, and so, well, you know, the, we hear many times when something like that happens, you stay with your vehicle. And that's what he decided to do. That was, uh, you know, the thing that he thought, thought would, good, would be good. Well, what he didn't realize was that the road he had turned on to was not only was it part of this state, uh, state park, but it was one that after the first snowfall, it gets closed. <laughs> and there wasn't going to be anybody coming up that road until the following March. And he was expecting the road clearing crews to be along and of course they didn't show up. And he's, you know, started to get a little a little bit worried as I can imagine. Uh, we all can imagine. He started to live, live off of some of the snacks that he had in his truck and this big camper on the back end. And then days turned into weeks. And finally, in late January, some snow skiers just happened to cross the truck. And they found it. He had died somewhere around January the 15th. And it was, he decided through that ordeal, he was, he was, he'd started to keep a journal. And that's how they figured it was somewhere around January 15th that he, that he died. And he, he wrote in the journal that uh, by the time Christmas rolled around, he, he said, well, I, I knew I was in real trouble, but by then I was so weak I, I couldn't do anything. Um, I just had to pray for, for help to come, and obviously help never never did come. But it was through that journal he kept making references to his big pickup truck. And even one of the entr entrances or entries into the journal was uh, when he realized he was getting weaker and sicker and that when he was found he was going to be spending a lot of time in the hospital, he had an entry in there, what to do with the truck. And so it leads one to believe, leads me to believe, I don't know if this is accurate, but, but maybe he thought that the truck was going to really be a means for him, to, for him to be saved. And obviously it didn't. When they found him and they fished him out, obviously he was uh, very uh, emaciated and dehydrated and, and everything. And they realized if he had gotten out and walked, if he'd gone maybe another 500 yards, is what they, there was an emergency call box right there. Uh, but he didn't know that. And so one, you know, raises the question, did, did he ever have a thought in there, should I get out and walk? Well, I have the energy, did I, should I get out and walk? 
I don't know. That's a, a question from silence. But but it seems that his concern for the truck was that he he saw that as a place of safety. And actually, what it turned out to be was well, he was he was opting out. You know, you could say he was opting out of life. Although he didn't realize necessarily, maybe he was doing that. But in re, in in reality, that's kind of what happened. And so here we are. We're in Lent. Fifth. Sunday in Lent. Next Sunday we have our Passion uh, Sunday, Palm Sunday. And Lent is a time for us to, to think about how is our relationship with God? Where is it? And is there maybe something that we're relying on, maybe that we think is keeping us safe, but really is something that's keeping us from life? I think that's that's what we, we tend to focus on in the season of Lent. And that draws me to this passage in John's Gospel. Before I get into some, some more general things about it, let me, let me share with you just a couple of the specifics that I think helps us understand it maybe just a, a little bit more. Number one, in verse 25, we hear the word life used three times. Verse 25 says, Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world, we'll keep it for eternal life. Three times the word life is used, but actually the first two come from a different word than the last one comes from. The first one really it has to do with our, more about, uh, well, it comes from the Greek word, you've heard me mention it before, psyche, that we get, we, or psychos, that we get psyche from. And it has more about a meaning towards our, our soul or our personality or who we are, you know, what, what makes us us, our likes, our dislikes. You know, we, we sometimes say, I like being around so-and-so because he or she, you know, is like this or has these kinds of likes, this, this kind of personality, this kind of disposition. And conversely, we might say, well, I don't like being around that person because of this, that, or the other thing, uh, whatever, it, whatever it might be. Uh, that's the kind of thing that it, it talks about in the first two times. Whoever loves his, his life, that which makes us us, loses it. And whoever hates his life, again, that which makes us us, hates his life in this world, will keep it for eternal life. And that third time actually is a different word that means more of, of where we connect with God. The Greek word is zoe rather, rather than psuko, psuche. And it, and it kind of is, is closer to, we wouldn't use the term spirit, but it's, it's where we connect to, to God, which is part, part, of our, part of our spirit. It's the, the spiritual vitality in which we, we tend to experience God's power and presence in our life. It's, so therefore, it's, it's less focused on us, and it's more focused on, on God's presence. And so do you, do you start to see what Jesus might have been saying here? Whoever loves his life loses it, and actually that loses really means they take an active, uh, active role in destroying that life. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Zoe is the word that's usually uh, used when we're talking about eternal life. Again, that, that type of the aspect of our life where we're in relationship with God. Then also, a little bit later on, he talks, uh, Jesus mentions, says, now my, my soul is, is troubled. That's, a, again, that's where that kind of that, that principle, or, or maybe I could say the divine individuality or the seat of, seat of impressions uh, takes, takes place as opposed, to, as opposed to the spirit, whereas the highest or maybe the deepest or the noblest part of the human person, again, that, that point of contact between God and man, and so soul is uh, is is where where that tends to take place. Now, if you keep those things in mind as as we share a little bit more in a general sense of this passage, then maybe maybe it'll take on some more significance. Where Jesus is in his life, when we get to this passage, is actually chronologically just after what we're going to celebrate next week, what we're going to observe next week, the triumphal entry. Just before this in John chapter 12 is the record of his entry into Jerusalem where they spread their coats 
and palm branches along the way. So he's just a, a few days away from the crucifixion. Just a few days. The Passover that's coming is the one that he's going to be crucified at, and he knows it. He sees it. He's been forecasting it. He's been telling his disciples for a while, I'm going to Jerusalem, and they're going to kill me. They're going to crucify me. And on the third day, I'm going to rise again. And it's in that context that these Greeks come to Andrew and, and Philip, and they say, we want to see Jesus. Now, isn't it interesting that when the, Philip and Andrew come to Jesus, and they say, there's some Greeks here that want to see you, Jesus doesn't respond to that at all. Did you notice that? He does, we don't know if he ever talked to him or saw him, but he immediately responded with this kind of strange uh, response of his. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He said before a couple of times, a few times, the hour, my hour has not yet come. But now, now he's saying my hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, we know that he's talking about himself, but also, immediately after that, he starts to talk about us. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. What Jesus is pointing to, when, he's, when, the, when the Greeks say, we want to see Jesus, he meets these say, what does it mean? In a sense, we could say, what does it mean to see Jesus? And he points, in essence, he points to the cross. You want to see me, you have to look to the cross. You have to look to my death to understand me to see me, to see the eternal purposes of God that I have come to, to live out, to bring to you, and to show you, and to encourage you in, in your walk with God as well. You want to see me look, look to the cross. He's not talking about any kind of self-help or self-improvement type of thing, but really his own death, and like I say, based on the couple uh, verses afterwards, our, our own death our death. Not just physical death, but our dying to self. Let me share with you a quote from A.W. Tozer. I think he, he grasped it pretty well. He says, The cross is the symbol of death. It stands for the abrupt, violent end of the human being. The man in Roman times who took up his cross and started down the road had already said goodbye to his friends. He was not coming back. He was not going out to have his life redirected. He was going out to have it ended. And the cross made no compromise, modified nothing, spared nothing. It slew all of the man completely and for good. It did not try to keep on good terms with its victim. It struck swift and hard, and when it had finished its work, the man was no more. That evangelism which draws friendly parallels between the ways of God and the ways of man is a false, is false to the Bible and cruel to the soul of the hearers. The faith of Christ does not parallel the world, it intersects it. In coming to Christ, we do not bring our life up on a higher plane, we leave it at a cross. The grain of wheat must fall into the ground and die. That is the beginning of the gospel. And that's what Jesus was really saying to those Greeks, to the disciples, to us here today. The beginning of the gospel, the beginning of entering into the gospel, is dying to self and living to Christ. And so, is there, is there maybe something in our life, like Tom Lind, the, the fellow that trusted in his truck, is there something in our life that we're relying on that we think is bringing safety to us that maybe really is bringing us to a level of death, a separation from God. You know, when Jesus said to, to the request of the uh, Philip and, and Andrew, you know, what, is it, what does it mean to see Jesus? Maybe do this. Picture picture in your hand, in your mind's eye, that you've got a grain of, of wheat in your hand. 
And then entertain the question for just a moment. Do you see everything that's there? And there are some ways that we would say yes, we do, but in their much more profound ways, we would say no. We don't see everything that's there. Not everything. In order to see everything that's there, what do you have to do? You have to take that and you have to put it in the ground. You have to bury it as if it's dead. You have to bury it. And then what happens? It starts to change. It starts to grow. It starts to sprout. It starts to first the, you know, the blade and the stalk and then the head and then you then you get then you get the, the wheat at the top of the head. And we might ask the question again: Is is that when we we see it? Is that all of it? And again, we could say, well, in a way, yes, but even more profoundly, no. That whole process has to start all over again, and it's not until. We don't see just one individual wheat plant, but a whole field of wheat. That we, then we can say, yes, now I see, when I look at this grain, now I see what's there. And that's what Jesus was, was saying, not only for himself, but for us as well. Not only was he one of those individual grains of wheat, but so were we. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servants be also. And if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Again, think back to that quote from Tozer. Going to the cross didn't leave anything of Jesus not crucified. And when we go to the cross, when we come to Christ, when we come to God, there's nothing of our life, our suke, that doesn't get crucified in order that we might enter into zoe, eternal life. And if there is something that we hold back because of we think it's safe, it's providing safety to us, then it may become our coffin, like that truck was for Tom Lind. And so Lent is a time when we think about that. It reminds me of that, that uh, uh, wonderfully uh, and famous quote by um, Jim Elliott, uh, who, uh, missionary to the uh, Auka Indians back in, what was it, the 50s, I think. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. And that's where Jesus is, and that's where he says, in a sense, we all are. And just as Jesus' soul was troubled, when we hear that kind of thing, aren't, isn't our soul troubled? Here's where grace really comes in. God the Father made it really, really clear to Jesus, this is what I want you to do. This is what I've called you to. This is who you are. This is your mission. This is what you're going to be. And he accepted that and he lived into it. God, the Father, will do the same sort of thing for us. This is who you are. This is your mission. This is your purpose. This is the things I wanted you to do. Kind of day in and day out type of basis. And it's not always going to be a lightning bolt revelation. It's going to be some of the disciplines of the church that we've touched on in recent weeks. Just doing the things that God says us to do. And that is a dying to self. It is coming to the cross and laying ourselves, so to speak, at the foot of the cross and say, I die, I choose to die, Christ, I want you to live through me. And he reveals more and more and more of that. So somebody once said it like this, living in self-renunciation embraces the law of self-preservation, but living in self-preservation embraces the law of self-destruction. If you work to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life, Jesus says, for my sake and the Gospels, you will gain your life. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. You know, what a caterpillar might call a death and the risk of the unknown, knowing what we know, we call it a butterfly. We don't call it the unknown. We don't call it risk. Butterf- the, the caterpillar might do that, but we don't. And 
God knows what we what we now know in our life, what we might call risk, what we might call the unknown. God says, no, that's that's the path to life. So are you? Let me ask you this before we, you know, we've got two weeks of of Lent left, and um, uh, the last week is a uh, home in a holy week. I want you, I want to ask you for these last two weeks. I want I want to ask you spend some real significant time in prayer and Bible reading and ask God, is there anything in my life that I'm holding on to so tight that I see as a maybe a safety net for me or whatever it might be that I, I have trouble letting go and giving to you? Is there anything in my life, whatever it may be? He'll reveal it if there is something. And after you pray a prayer like that, just pay attention to what shows up in your mind. Oftentimes, we think, oh, you know, well, I, I, I had a vision of this person that I used to know many, many years ago. And we think, well, what's, what's the relevance of that? I haven't seen that person for 50 years. Well, the relevance may be that, well, I haven't forgiven that person. <laughs> Just when you pray a prayer like that, God revealed to me, see what shows up. And see if there is some relevance, because we may be holding on to it and we may need to release that. And it may be an aspect, some other part of our life. And we may be realizing that we're stuck in a truck, so to speak, in a spiritual a snowbound, and the, the call box is just a little bit ahead. But we don't want to get out of the truck and go through the, the snow for 500 yards to get to it. And so we end up dying. Jesus says, truly, truly, or amen, amen, that's, that's a key. Pay attention, to pay real close attention to what he's saying. And he said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your grace. And we thank you that you have given us the gift of eternal life. But Father, so often we, we run off and we, we go do things and we think that uh, we're following you. And we need you to reveal to us if that is indeed true. Or if we've uh, allowed something to come into our life that we have placed at a higher position of, of desire, of need, of priority, of want than your very presence, than your guiding. Lord, help us to know that we need to give up and, sh and to know how to give up our, our psuche life in order that we might have zoe life. Be glorified, Father. Strengthen your church in all that we say, do, and are, and may your kingdom uh, be expanded across the globe. For it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.